Stuart Hameroff, who needs no introduction. All right, thank you, Hakwan. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, the title of my talk is Fractal Scale Free Consciousness. And uh, Archimedes said, if I had a lever and a place to stand, I could move the world. And I use this as an example of traversing scale. He was obviously much smaller than the Earth. And uh, it, this is how one can traverse scale. And one can imagine the Earth then moving something else, even the sun and the sun moving the galaxy, if you pro appropriate set of levers. And I think this represents the idea of traversing scale. So, there are a number of scale-free uh, or scale-invariant uh, uh, fractal-like processes, one over F, uh, a noise. Conformal is another uh, word for a similar type of thing, in which, uh, which is basically scale-invariant scale or scale-free. We've heard the first two talks about EEG patterns being uh, self-similar at different scales. Also, there are reports of fractal eye movements and visual search which use fractal type patterns to zoom in on, on what uh, the person is searching for. Small world networks in the brain, uh, are, neural networks in the brain are thought to be arranged kind of like airport hubs where you have a few uh, large hubs with many connections and uh, many small hubs uh, with uh, few connections so that you can get from point A to point B with a relatively uh, small number of, of hops or steps or flights. And of course, the idea that uh, the brain, or, or memory at least, is arranged holographically, uh, put forth by Carl Prebram and others. Another one that I'll, I'll talk about briefly, since it hasn't been discussed, is grid cells, uh, which have a hexagonal spatial representation and a fractal uh, representation. So grid cells were discovered by Moser et al. Uh, in Scandinavia a few years ago. And basically, um, they're kind of like place cells in the hippocampus except they're, they're in the entorhinal cortex. So uh, the experiment is they put, uh, they implant electrodes in the entorhinal cortex of, of freely moving animals, rats, and they move around a, a grid, a space, let's say a square space. And what you see in red is a particular neuron firing at a particular geometric place in the grid. So imagine this, this grid is, is a square, and when the animal gets to a particular point, um, then the neuron fires, and the animal moves again, and that same neuron will fire. And when you plot where the animal, where that neuron in the entorhinal cortex fires, you get this hexagonal grid, uh, which is um, uh, geometric and, as I said, hexagonal. Now, there's a couple of uh, m sort of mysterious questions about this. Uh, this hexagonal, uh, you can look at it as a triangle also, depending on, but it, or you put them together and get a hexagon. So you have geometric firing fields of grid cells in the entorhinal cortex, uh, which uh, you know, may be innate perception of space. This is a debatable point. If it's not, then you have to say that the animal remembers exactly where he or she has been and reconstructs it. Um, but some people, including Lynn Adele at the University of Arizona here, uh, suggest that this is uh, innate perception of space along the lines of Kant, Kantian uh, representation of Euclidean space. So I just can't resist saying that. Um, also, if you go to deeper levels of the entorhinal cortex, or as Moser did, you get uh, the same sort of uh, hexagonal patterns, but the uh, spatial representation in the grid is, is a finer scale. So it's kind of like a Google map where you zoom in and you, you're seeing the same territory except at a finer scale. So apparently, uh, we have this fractal-like uh, hexagonal uh, zoom-in mode, or at least animals do, and presumably we do, and there's some evidence in humans also, that uh, there's a fractal hexagonal represent representation of space at the level of neuronal networks. So these are grid cells. Now, what about, uh, what about smaller levels? So fractals should be scale-free. We've heard about neuronal networks. And uh, what about going smaller, going uh, to the level of neurons, for example? So let's consider a neuron. And uh, here's a Hodgkin-Huxley neuron. This is the classic model that goes back uh, about a half a century, where the dendrites in the cell body receive inputs, integrate those inputs and uh, to a threshold at the axon hillock, or axon initiation segment, uh, with the signals propagating along the membrane by ion channels, shown here. And if the, if the threshold is met, this triggers 
a spike, a firing, which goes to the next neuron. And that's basically the story of how uh, neurons are supposed to work um, according to the Hodgkin-Huxley model, which is the, the gold standard in, in neuroscience and has been for many years. Um, so if we put a network together of uh, simple toy neurons like that with inputs over here and outputs here, here, and here, and just, and just uh, let this run with inputs and outputs, we get you know, computation and we can do sort of interesting things uh, explaining cognition. But um, what's missing, of course, is consciousness. Um, because uh, it, this is the hard problem. Why would computation among neurons give rise to consciousness? Also, where's the synchrony? We've heard uh, that gamma synchrony is the best neural correlate of consciousness. Even skeptics like Jesse Prince this morning has come around to uh, uh, agreeing that uh, gamma synchrony is the best neural correlate of consciousness. But when you have uh, neurons connected linearly, uh, there's delays and you don't get synchrony. You need side-to-side -side, uh, connections, gap junctions, and, and, uh, and electrical synapses to get synchrony. So we don't get that out of the Hodgkin-Huxley uh, neuron. And also, where's free will? Because um, the activity in processing a sensory input takes a, takes a time, several hundred milliseconds, and in a, in a um, uh, <clears throat> cocktail party conversation, for example, you say something to me and I answer back before my brain has processed, or at least before the activity that seems to correlate with processing what you said has occurred. Therefore, the assumption in neuroscience and cognitive science is that we respond non-consciously and have uh, a false illusion after the fact of being in conscious control, that consciousness is epiphenomenal. And that's, that's uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the, the standard, in, standard uh, dogma in neuroscience. Now, there's a couple of problems with the, uh, the uh, Hodgkin-Huxley neuron, and let me just show you one of them. So at the bottom here is, the, uh, is what is predicted by the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron. These would be the integration potentials in the dendrite and the cell body. And then these would be the axon, the axon spikes, so the ac action potential. And it's a very narrow threshold, which is predicted by the, um, the Hodgkin-Huxley equation, and slope, sloping upward, because if you look at the axon, um, toy axon here, we have uh, uh, ion channels that would open sequentially. So as they open sequentially, you get this kind of gradual slope. Now, Nandorf et al. in 2006 uh, studied neurons, cortical neurons, in uh, conscious animals, and what they found was something completely different, or not completely different, but somewhat different. So here's the integration here. But uh, the spiking, first of all, is the threshold is very, very wide. So there's variability in spike threshold from neuron firing to neuron firing. There's something missing. It's not just integration. There's some other factor that determines spiking. It could represent consciousness, and it could be coming from inside the cell or possibly from lateral cells via gap junctions, for example. <clears throat> and also, it's very vertical. The, the, um, these, uh, the spikes are vertical, which means that the ion channels over here are opening simultaneously. They're communicating and opening simultaneously. So rather than a... Uh, um, the depolarization wave opening them sequentially, they're opening simultaneously. And that suggested either some kind of electromagnetic uh, connection or even a quantum entanglement among ion channels as proposed by uh, interpretations of M McKinnon's Nobel Prize uh, work a few years ago. So a couple problems with, with the uh, Hodgkin-Huxley neuron. Another problem with the general view that consciousness arises from emergent computation among neurons is that neurons are assumed to be simple switches in that model, and actually neurons may be much more complicated. And to prove, the, to show, illustrate this, we look at a single cell, like a paramecium, which is one cell, like a neuron is one cell. It can uh, swim around, avoid obstacles. Uh, it can learn if you suck it into a capillary tube, it escapes faster each time. It can avoid predators, it can find food, it can find a mate and have sex. And this is actually an X-rated uh, picture over here of two paramecia. Uh, having sex, and perhaps they're having a conscious experience as uh, represented by Bing. Uh, we don't know, um, but um, anyway, uh, it's a single cell. It's rather clever, and I always tell my AI colleagues to uh, not worry about simulating a brain, but simulate a paramecium and go from there. <clears throat> so um, the, to summarize, the, the conventional view of brain is neuronal computer, and I'm, I'm telling you this to, to illustrate where we have to look elsewhere or look deeper, cannot account for consciousness, the hard problem. Uh, you might say that it emerges 
due to complex computation, but no threshold has been specified. Cannot account for gamma synchrony uh, without lateral connections, electrical uh, uh, gap junctions, which correlates with consciousness. The brain activity comes too late for real-time conscious control, rendering consciousness epiphenomenal and illusion. And it's based on networks of simple neuron switches, which and uh, cannot account for we cannot account for the cognitive abilities of single cells. So perhaps we need to look at a deeper, finer scale in, in the context of fractals uh, going de uh, lower in a, in a fractal hierarchy. So we look at, the in look at a cell, look at the interior of a cell, and this is an immunofluorescence of a cell and culture. It, it's not a neuron, but it, you know, it, it illustrates the point. A double nucleated cell, actin is in red, and the yellow are the microtubules, the cytoskeletal structure that I've been obsessed with for almost 40 years, and you know that that was coming in this talk, probably. And uh, so here are the microtubules, and if we look, uh, look more closely inside a neuron, they're arranged like this. So here is, uh, here is the axon terminal with, with a couple microtubules and actin and neurotransmitter vesicles released into the synapse, postsynaptic receptors on a spine, and with actin going into the microtubules. So A are the regions where most everybody looks for cognition and consciousness at the level of synapses and membrane potentials. But uh, I submit that actually we should also be looking over here in the cytoskeleton in the microtubules in zone B uh, for, the, uh, for the origin of consciousness and also for a lower level in a fractal hierarchy which gives rise to consciousness. So uh, a number of years ago, myself and colleagues uh, looked at microtubules as computers, the idea that each, here's a microtubule over here with a, it's a, a cylindrical uh, polymer of tubulin proteins, and we came up with the idea that the tubulin could switch between different states, representing bits of information, and also be in superposition of, of both possible states, and uh, taking the lattice geometry and the dipole coupling uh, among neighbor states, uh, played the game of life. The game of life is a cellular automaton, uh, the simplest form of computation uh, done on a grid in which each cell can either be uh, black or white, dead or alive, depending on the neighbor states. And this was very popular in the 80s. And you could do all kinds of complex computation with, with this very simple game of life. So we applied it to the hexagonal lattice of microtubules based on the dipole coupling forces and showed that you could get information processing uh, and propagating through the microtubule lattice, which could interact and do, uh, and do computation. So here's a, uh, a sequence of, uh, of uh, pieces of a microtubule with just patterns evolving and, and, and changing and doing uh, processing. And the time steps here would be, uh, uh, say, uh, 10 megahertz, uh, and for reasons that I'll discuss later. So uh, we also talked about topological quantum computing in which the, the helical pathways could be the bits which uh, interact and uh, giving topological quantum computing uh, using the, the geometry, the mathematical geometry of the microtubule. So we'll come back to that point, but let me talk about memory for a second because this, this plays a key role. So the, the, uh, the best model for memory is long-term potentiation, or LTP, in which presynaptic excitation, uh, brief but high intensity, causes prolonged sensitivity at the postsynaptic membrane, uh, which gives rise to memory. Now the problem with this is that these proteins on the membrane last only hours to days, and memories can last a lifetime. Well, it turns out that a key player is this uh, uh, snowflake-shaped hexagonal uh, holo uh, enzyme called CAMK2, calcium chemomodulin kinase 2, which can phosphorylate substrates and phosphorylate something inside the neuron which seems to store long-term memory, or at least, at least short-term memory. And we know they associate with microtubules. So uh, um, <clears throat> my colleagues Travis Craddock and Jack Tusinski and I looked at this and, and asked the question, maybe CAMK2 is phosphorylating microtubules. So here's uh, CAMK2. Uh, looking at it from top down, here it is in side view, and when calcium, when calcium comes in, and uh, in LTP, for example, and in memory formation, this is transformed, kind of like a transformer in the movies, where kinase domains, six kinase domains ex extend upwards, and six kinase dom domains ex extend downwards, uh, turning this into some kind of weird insect-looking thing, or a nano poodle, as some of us like to call it, because of these legs, and uh, each of these kinase domains have phosphorylation sites here. So each of the six below and above 
uh, can phosphorylate or not phosphorylate a substrate. And therefore, uh, each of these is a bit of information. And each CAMK2 conveys six bits of information, potentially, or a byte. An ordered array of bits is a byte. So what might be the, the substrate for phosphorylation and encoding of memory inside neurons? Well, you guessed it. Microtubules are uh, a worthy suspect. And so we looked at the, uh, the relative scale and geometry and binding of CAMK2. Here we see um, a microtubule here and a uh, tubule in here. Now, these scales are different. Here's 5 nanometers, and this is 20 nanometers. So when we bring, them, uh, when we bring CAMK2 on the same scale and overlaid on the A lattice or the B lattice, we see that there's a, a, a perfect fit for the geometry of the, uh, the CAMK2 on the microtubule. And here we see the uh, nanorobot, uh, nanopoodle landing, docking on the microtubule, and able to impart uh, bits of information from its six kinase domains onto the uh, microtubule. And here we show that we actually go down the amino acid level and show the phosphorylation mechanisms. <clears throat> and so um, there's a tremendous uh, capacity for information processing on a local neighborhood of, of tubulin. And if you make some assumptions, you get up to 5,000 uh, bits of information per little neighborhood of microtubules. So there's a lot of potential for information processing. And this was published uh, a few weeks ago in PLOS Computational Biology. Uh, and you can see the, the reference there. So the point is, in the, in the context of this talk, is that um, we get a hexagonal pattern, uh, potentially, if all six bits are, are encoded from CAMK2 onto microtubules. And I think the hexagon and, and fractal, uh, fractal arrays of hexagons may be a, a clue to, how, to the logic of consciousness and cognition, intracellularly and extracellularly. So let me just briefly mention Alzheimer's disease, which is, which is what happens when your microtubules fall apart. There's amyloid plaques outside the neuron and neurofibrillary tangles inside the neuron. And the amyloid plaques uh, are where the, the genes point to, but the pathology the cognitive dysfunction comes from the, the uh, microtubules and the tau protein falling off. And uh, we, uh, we just published a paper in, in PLOS One about this, making a connection between the amyloid and, and the neurofibrillary tangles by zinc. But I'm not going to talk about that. What happens is the tau falls off, whether the tau gets phosphorylated and then falls off, or the microtubule destabilizes and then the tau falls off is unclear. And uh, the tau, it turns out, plays a, plays a significant role in, uh, in, in telling where motor proteins get off to deliver their, their cargo to the synapse. So here's a, uh, here's a neuron. Let's say this is a dendrite. The axon would be over here. And let's say you want to you wanna upgrade a synapse over here. Well, the, the material is synthesized here. It must be transported by these motor proteins, these kinesins or dynines, depending on which way you're going and uh, hop from microtubule to microtubule and then decide to make a left turn and a left turn to get to the right spot. Well, how do they know how to do that? It turns out that tau is the traffic signal and tells them when to get off. But then the question is, how does the tau know where it should bind to do its thing? And that's, I think, uh, due to intrinsic information encoded in the microtubule. But the motor proteins are interesting for another, from another standpoint. Um, a recent paper in, uh, in Nature uh, used uh, t uh, motor proteins and microtubules only, and uh, you put them together, and and the motor and they kind of run along each other and interact. And to make a long story short, uh, microtubules and motor proteins alone form hexagonal vortices about 40 microns in diameter. So um, this is a sequence of time, and you can see after uh, after a period of time we get these hexagonal vortices that are made up of microtubules. So we have hexagons uh, at the micro single microtubule level, at the level of many microtubules, and then at the level of, for example, grid cells in, uh, in enterorhinal cortex. So if microtubules are processing information, as many of us believe, uh, that raises the information capacity of the cell, of the neuron, tremendously. And uh, for example, the, without microtubules, you get about 10 to the 16th operations per second. With microtubules, you get 10 orders of magnitude increase, which, uh, it's, which is very unpopular among AI types trying to simulate the brain. Um, because you get 10 to the 26 operations per second at the level of microtubules. However, we can ask the same question, how does that explain consciousness? It's just more computation. Is there something else required, and might that be quantum physics? Well, um, 
I don't have time to go into this in too much detail, but uh, uh, quantum, quantum physics occurs generally at small scales, and uh, it has weird properties like things being in multiple places at the same time, and yet we don't see that in the real world, and so why not? Well, one explanation is that the conscious observer causes collapse of the wave function, and this is exemplified in, in, the, uh, in Schrodinger's cat story, where a quantum, a quantum system is amplified to uh, cause the release of poison and not cause release of the poison, therefore causing a cat to be dead and alive at the same time until someone opens the box and looks at the, observe, looks at the, at the cat, and only then does, uh, does, does the cat decide, or is the system dead, is the cat dead or alive? Now this is, uh, I don't believe this, and neither does Roger Penrose with whom I collaborate, uh, but the point is, uh, this is a real pickle to try to understand how this can, why this doesn't happen, because we don't know what would terminate the, the quantum superposition. But from our standpoint, more importantly, this puts consciousness outside of, of science. It says consciousness, and this is what Bohr and Wigner did in the early days of quantum mechanics, that consciousness is, is, is something outside of science that causes collapse of the wave function so they could do their science. So, um, uh, but that's the observer effect in, in quantum mechanics. Another possibility is every superposition branches off to form a whole new universe. This is actually a very popular view called the para multiple worlds hypothesis. Now a third view that brings consciousness into science, which is as far as I know, the only, the only picture that does this is by Roger Penrose, uh, who said there's an, there exists in superposition an objective threshold for quantum state reduction, which he called objective reduction, OR that quantum superpositions grow to meet this threshold uh, when they, the threshold is given by E equals H over T, where E is the amount of superposition, the, the amount of mass uh, separated from itself or space-time separated from itself. H bar is Planck's constant over 2 pi, and T is time, the time at which the self-collapse will occur and will undergo a spontaneous self-collapse termed, termed objective reduction. So this kind of combined general relativity and quantum mechanics, which was a pretty neat trick. But even, even more, he said uh, in his 1989 book, each such event is accompanied by a moment of consciousness, moment of conscious awareness. Awareness is over there. And uh, he explained this in the following way, that, that space-time, which is normally three dimensions, here condensed to one dimension, one dimension of time to get a two-dimensional space-time sheet. So if an object is over here, it's like curvature into the screen. If an object is over here, it's curvature towards us. And a superposition would be separation, curvature in both directions. And you can imagine in the multiple worlds hypothesis that these would branch off to form a new universe. But in the Penrose formulation, they meet this threshold, E equals H over T here, and there's a moment of conscious awareness signified by Bing. <clears throat> Now this is very similar to what uh, Whitehead, uh, who is a process philosopher, uh, said that reality is comprised not of things but of events, and that some of these events could be conscious, as we see here, that mentality is due to occasions of experience, events in a wider field of proto-conscious experience. And Abner Shimini made the connection between Whitehead occasions and quantum state reductions. So what Roger said essentially was that consciousness is an actual physical process, a sequence of quantum state reductions connected by E equals H over T to an objective threshold inherent in space-time geometry, objective reduction, and that consciousness or its precursors was built into the most basic level of the universe. Now that's a, that's a way to, to approach the hard problem by saying that, that qualia or consciousness derive from the, the universe much like other irreducible features like mass, spin, or charge. It just comes with a territory, it's built in. But then we have to show how it's connected to the brain. So basically, the, here's the superposition separation, and E uh, time T here, uh, there's the Bing moment. So where in the brain could this occur? Well, uh, Roger didn't have a good candidate, and I suggested to him microtubules, and at the very first Tucson conference in 1994, he was here along with Ben Libet and many other people, and afterwards, uh, a number of us uh, went on a trip to the Grand Canyon, and there's, there's Roger there, there's his wife Vanessa, there I am, there's Dave, and a few other people, and uh, during this hike, uh, uh, we kind of started cooking up our model, which became known as orchestrated objective reduction, basically shown here that in, uh, in microtubules inside neurons, each tubulin can be a, what's called a qubit, a quantum bit, 
a bit of, of a one or zero, blue or red, but also quantum superposition of both, which would uh, communicate by entanglement with many others, reach this threshold and have self-collapse and ORCOR, orchestrated objective reduction moments in the brain. So in this scheme, we have the superposition shown in gray. It builds to a threshold arbitrarily between six and seven here, and there's a conscious moment. It chooses uh, new states which, which tell the neuron to fire, not fire, adjust synapses, and then goes on from there. And the uh, quantum state would spread by entanglement through uh, gap junctions to link large parts of the brain, microtubules in, in significant proportions of the brain. So basically the idea is microtubules reach this threshold, there's a conscious moment, bing, uh, shown here as a, as a diagram, and here is space-time geometry. So this is a connection between what's going on in the brain and space-time geometry, and a sequence of such moments, say at 25 milliseconds in gamma synchrony, would look something like this, and quantum information is also sent backwards in time, to, uh, to account for how we can have real-time conscious control. And Daryl Bem will talk uh, on Friday about how uh, evidence for backward time effects. And also Libet talked about that in his sensory experiments. And uh, everybody talks about his volitional experiments, but his sensory experiments showed backward time effects, uh, which I think are, are even more important than his other work. <clears throat> So our approach to the hard problem would be, would be this. Now the conventional explanation is that the redness of the rose, the qualia of the rose, is due to a pattern of activity in her brain. But our approach would be that the qualia of the rose is due to a pattern in fundamental space-time geometry shown as this simple curvature, obviously much more complicated than that, but in a two-dimensional uh, two space-time sheet, which is then reproduced or recreated in her brain. Uh, since it's non-local, this actually may be, the, may be directly connected, or she recreates the same space-time geometry in her brain, and the bing occurs here, but it's also out here in the universe. Okay, well, that sounds fine, but uh, what about, uh, you know, the, the details? And we've been subjected to a lot of criticism even before our model uh, was, was published by Pat Churchland, Max Tegmark, and uh, a number of other people, and most recently this group of uh, Australians who wrote, uh, went on a sort of a rampage attacking us and wrote several papers, and one of which said, uh, Penrose Hameroff orchestrated objective reduction proposal for human consciousness is not biologically feasible, and published that in Phys Rev E. I'll come to the other paper in a second. Well, and they also said that, that it, not only is it unfeasible, it can't be, uh, it can't be uh, fixed by any modification. So I thought that was a bit surprising. Now, they did have one legitimate beef, and, and, and that is that if you consider this conformational switching of the protein uh, that um, due to one uh, aromatic ring in the, in the hydrophobic pocket, uh, that requires a lot of energy, time, and would generate heat. Um, so that was a legitimate uh, complaint, and we never really needed the mechanical switching part. Uh, <clears throat> the other part, they said, was that the single aromatic ring couldn't be a switch because it's really uh, delocalized according to molecular orbital theory. But we had already changed that for our, hydro, for our uh, quantum switch or trigger to be uh, nonpolar uh, hydrophobic pockets uh, within the protein, which is where anesthetics act, by the way, uh, due to not just not one, but two or more of these aromatic rings. It takes two to tangle, you might say. And you need, a, you need at least two, and, and probably more than that, to have this, these cooperative London force couplings which control the protein state. So uh, we revised the model last year in a, in a pa new paper that Roger and I wrote, the idea being that, uh, that uh, the actu there's no actual conformational state uh, switching required, there's superposition at the level of atomic nuclei to get the quantum effect, but uh, the dipole uh, coupling in the nonpolar aromatic groups can oscillate back and forth at 8 megahertz because there's evidence for a resonance at 8 megahertz in microtubules. So that gets, that gets around both of their objections. Now their other objection, uh, well I'll come back to that. Let me just uh, elaborate a little bit on uh, zooming in on tubulin and uh, the, the hydrophobic pockets are actually uh, linear grooves of aromatic rings. This is work by Travis Craddock, uh, Jack Jasinski, and myself, looking at uh, anesthetic binding sites uh, near aromatic rings, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. And uh, in the, uh, the green are the anesthetic binding sites, and the, the brown are low affinity binding sites. And uh, they're very close to these uh, grooves, hydrophobic grooves, rather than uh, hydrophobic pockets in the tubulin. Uh, 
Now, the reason that that's significant is that they line up, and this is very similar to the quantum effect seen in uh, photosynthesis, where you have chromophores, and they li line up like this, which, which allows uh, one to have topological quantum computing, which is the most stable form of quantum computing, very resistant to decoherence. And so the, the information would be the path that a, that a quantum state takes going around the microtubule. Uh, so the other objection was about Froehlich condensation and, the, and whether you can have quantum states in microtubules. And that's been answered by a series of experiments uh, by uh, uh, a team led by Anurban Bandyapati, who spoke at this meeting uh, two years ago and whom I just saw in Switzerland uh, last week. And this is coming out in Nature Materials uh, in the next month or so. And basically, they put microtubules in, uh, <clears throat> in this heat bath and, uh, and they assemble uh, at a given rate. If you apply alternating current at megahertz, uh, they increase their assembly 50,000 fold. So there's some kind of resonant effect. And here we see the microtubules here. And um, <clears throat> also, so here's a microtubule with four electrodes on it. So you can stimulate with two, record with two. And what they find, and this is, this is the, uh, the key point here, uh, that you get resonance where the resistance uh, drops precipitously at about 8 megahertz, uh, 20 megahertz, uh, also 12 kilohertz uh, shown here. And so these are resonance, uh, resonances in the microtubules uh, which give rise to uh, uh, essentially quantum superconduction. And the, the megahertz is, is important because this is ultrasound and we can stimulate the brain directly, non-invasively uh, with uh, transcranial ultrasound. And we have a paper uh, being uh, revised, uh, in, uh, being reviewed right now on the effects of transcranial ultrasound on mental states. So we'll, we'll see about that. I was the guinea pig, obviously. Um, so let me uh, try to wrap up here since uh, I'm running out of time. But by E equals H over T, uh, consciousness can occur. That's basically our, our, th our formula. And it's the only formula I know that predicts consciousness. If somebody else knows of one, let me know. Um, for T equals 25 milliseconds, this gives you about 2 times 10 to the 10th tubulins, which is roughly about 20,000 neurons. So here come, now let's go back to the fractal business. Scale-free dynamics in the, in the brain by E equals H over T. And here we have uh, Rakel's uh, uh, um, default mode switching, which could also be the, the slow conductance the body was talking about, with a time of about uh, 10 seconds or uh, 0.1 hertz. Uh, at gamma synchrony, you get uh, 100 hertz. Uh, in uh, microtubules, you get uh, 10,000 hertz, megahertz, uh, gigahertz, and even terahertz. And these are all separated by, by about three orders of magnitude, which is the optimal for 1 over F noise and fractals. So consciousness can occur at, at any of these levels and can actually move among the levels. And there's about 10 to the 20th tubulins in the brain. So you would actually run out of tubulins, run out of brain when you get down to this level. Now, this, this idea that consciousness can move in a hierarchy in, in scale, kind of like octaves, is very much like music. It's also consistent with Eastern philosophy. It looks at uh, levels in the hierarchy where consciousness can move, and lokas, they're called. And uh, this is from uh, Eastern philosophy, where we actually get frequencies shown here. So consciousness can move up and down these scales. And since it's happening in space-time geometry, and since space-time geometry itself seems to be fractal or scale invariant, it could be that consciousness is moving uh, at, to finer and finer scales of, uh, of space-time geometry. So Bing could be occurring uh, at, at smaller and smaller scales. But as you go down in scale, E gets larger, and you get more intense experience. Although the energy required uh, comes from the uh, space-time then, you don't really need it in the brain. Which is why, for example, when in an altered state, as we're going to hear about uh, Saturday, for example, with uh, psilocybin mushrooms, the, the brain becomes metabolically quiet. It looks, like, it looks like there's nothing going on because consciousness, I would argue, has gone deep into the quantum level. And uh, you don't need membrane depolarization. So behavior might be impaired, but consciousness is enhanced tremendously. So as the Beatles said, the deeper you go, the higher you fly, the higher you fly, the deeper you go. As you go further into, deeper into this uh, fractal hierarchy, deeper into the brain.
So uh, I want to mention the hexagonal things because we have hexagons from uh, the, the benzene rings that make up the hydrophobic pockets. We have hexagons on the microtubule lattice. We have hexagons from multiple uh, microtubules. We have hexagons in grid cells. And uh, this reminded me of something, and I couldn't think of what it was until yesterday. And I read a book a long time ago called The Library of Babel by Ho Jorge Luis Borges, Borges who, said, who described a vast library, a universe, a universe consisting of an enormous expanse of interlocking hexagonal rooms. And this is a metaphor for his mind. I think that was quite clear from reading the book. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I kept, when I read this, I go, wow, this guy is, is really out there. And, uh, but perhaps he was directly perceiving what's going on. So these are just some pictures that people have done of the, of the library, library of Babel. This one kind of looks like the uh, hydrophobic pocket with the uh, benzene rings. And uh, this one uh, looks like uh, maybe the inside of a neuron. So um, the point is, so I think this is a, a metaphor. It's obviously a metaphor, but it might be a direct insight into what's going on in the brain. So let me conclude by saying three things. Consciousness may occur at various levels or scales by E equals H over T in a fractal-like brain hierarchy. Consciousness and cognition may utilize a perhaps hexagonally based scale-free logic system. And finally, the penrose hamroff orko R theory is definitely alive and well. Thank you very much. So uh, once again, we can take a couple of quick questions before we open up. So would the gentleman over there be mind coming up so I don't have to run all the way. Uh, I, I actually would, may I give that person, no, because no, he, I'm, I'm is he volunteering? No, no, he, I think he's going to ask a I'm question. <laughs> Hi. So I'm actually not going to have a beef with the small scale, but I am, I do have an issue with um, some of the premises that I think he snuck by at the beginning. And that's the Hodgkin-Huxley, and not, not that I'm a big fan of Hodgkin-Huxley models per se, but you can do a lot. Certainly you can get synchrony, you can get very, very small networks to do all different kinds of dynamics and computation. In fact, integrated in fire or even cellular automata, uh, you hook them up, five, a five cell network will give you more possibilities than you'll know what to do with. So the bottom line of the question is, if we can do all of this at the higher scale without any of the details, why you know, build in all those details more, and more so, doesn't that pose, you know, cause a problem? Because if you can do all the computation, we're back to a harder problem, you can do all the stuff without all the details, at least cognitively and functionally, why do we need these microtubules? Why do we need consciousness? Why do we need consciousness? No, no I, I'm not, I, I'm a fan of consciousness, don't take it away. <laughs> but I'm saying the point is that computationally, you don't need all that stuff. Computation doesn't account for consciousness. This is toward the science of consciousness, not toward the science of computation. Right, but of course that brings us to the question. So, you know, if you can walk around, you know, and of course we always come back to the zombies, but if you can walk around doing all the stuff that you do, or what is it that you can't do, let's put it that way, uh, with a five cell network that doesn't have any of the detailed stuff. So the claim you made was that you can't do synchrony, for example, well, which I'm is actually quite easy to do. It's in fact I'm the claiming you problem. can't have consciousness. I'm claiming you can't have consciousness without it. I think just neural, neural networks by chemical synapses without synchrony, without quantum effects, I'm arguing cannot account for consciousness. Uh, that's why this is toward a science of consciousness because nobody's come up with an explanation. So if I show you a network with a, say 100 units or 500 units that can do these computations, that can move around, that can do synchrony, in fact I don't believe that the synchrony is the problem, synchrony is really cheap, it comes, it's with sad to see prints get converted as well, <laughs> but you get it quite cheaply. If I can show you that you can do that with a network with five or a hundred units, and they can do all these things and operate in the world, why do I need all those details? And how, or another side of that question is, how can you show me that that actually, that I need consciousness above and beyond that? Are you claiming that's conscious? What you, what you just described, is it going to be conscious? I'm not claiming that at all. Uh, well, then what's know, the point? I, the point is that that's a, it's a problem for us, right? As scientists that are trying to figure out what consciousness is, if I can generate a network that can do everything that the conscious Everything can do. but consciousness. How would you know that it's not I think, conscious? I think they'd get into the, right, the rhyme of deeper discussion. Right. So maybe okay. let's pass on to, to after the next, after the next How about question. George? Um, I've got a very simple alternative method of objective reduction of the wave packet for you. It turns out that when you have uh, these systems which show fractal behavior, they're all based on critical points. On what? It, on critical points. Yeah. And at critical points, you can show that they are self-observing systems. 
a self-observing system due to its own non-linearity in the critical points actually reduces wave packets. It's a thermodynamic effect. No one has taken any notice of it. I shall be doing a poster on self-observing systems, and I would like to invite you to take an interest in it. Well, I will, but a self-observing system, uh, what does that mean? I mean, yes. you're, you're deferring the hard problem. You know, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll define it for you. You have a, a feedback loop. You can't have any regulation without feedback loops. Uh, feedback loops can get to critical points just as when you hold a microphone in front of a, a, a loudspeaker and you get just the right amount of feedback. You get an instability which is based on the fact that the feedback gain is one. Yeah. It's not less than one and it's not more than one. At the feedback gain equals one, you get quantum mechanical effects which prove that it's a self-observing system. It actually destroys all the quanta in the system and you get something else. And uh, this is a completely new idea, and it's not easy to put it just into two well, sentences. I'd be happy to take like a look at it, but a, a video camera pointed at a mirror is technically a self-observing system that doesn't make it conscious. This is, this is a, a much more subtle thing, which takes... Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid for a new idea, maybe we need to go into the new discussion to, to open up. So this is really for quick questions. May we answer and I take one more quick question that we may open up for discussion. Then we can also ask questions too. Yeah. I, I have two specific questions. You can only answer one if you have time for that. Thank you for the provocative talk. So I wanted to ask about the association of scale-free power law behavior and consciousness. Uh, BU showed data regarding non-REM sleep uh, having scale-free phenomena. You know our work uh, with anesthetics. Yeah. Um, how do you respond to that in terms of scale-free being the basis of consciousness? I don't think fractal or scale-free activity is consciousness. I think uh, only if it involves the quantum, which means you have to go down b below a certain level. So for example, if, if under anesthesia, I, you wouldn't have the, if, if you think of it as a sequence of levels, you're wiping out everything below a certain level. You're still going to get the neural activity that we can measure above it. We may lose gamma, we may, may lose some other things. And pursuant to that, one more specific question. Uh, there have been many studies showing that a point mutation and GABA receptor will alter anesthetic sensitivity. Do you have any data uh, regarding microtubules, tubulins, uh, tubulin-associated proteins suggesting that there's a differential anesthetic sensitivity? Well, I, well Rod Eckenhoff does. As you know, Rod Eckenhoff uh, took uh, mouse brain and uh, radio labeled halothane and found, what was it, 140 proteins in the mouse brain neuron that binds halothane. He then did genetic uh, studies to see which genes were upregulated or downregulated, figuring that, that, the, that the functional target would have its genes upregulated or downregulated, and the one, the, the, the protein, the gene uh, that was most upregulated was the one for tubulin. All right, so uh, I think it's time to move on to a panel discussion. Uh, let's thank the speaker once again for that. Uh, so I think all three speakers have their so microphone off. on. Can, can you use your, just the, the clip mic, is it okay? Can you turn on all your clip mics so you can, because we don't, we're running out of microphones. Before we start the first question, may I make a comment? Because we are running a bit out of time, I understand this is usually a very exciting time and meeting every, once every two years, but try to re restrict the questions to the speaker's material, then we have kind of a more focused discussion rather than your own ideas. That would help a little bit because we're just running out of time. So anyone want to kickstart the first question? Can yeah. I make a comment to George's question? Yeah. Okay, so. um, can you hear me? Okay. So you, you mentioned that the power spectrum in slow wave sleep was similar in the scale-free component. That's a great question. And I just wanted to mention that um, in line with what I said about the structure within the scale-free activity. Um, so even if you have the identical power spectrum, the temporal spatial structure in the signal could be different. So um, in fact, uh, uh, if you look into more um, of the details of the signal, uh, it starts to become different in the, in the slow wave sleep. So if you allow me to be moderately selfish, I ask the first question, it's which, which would uh, direct towards at least two of you. So, so you mentioned about the, the antagonistic relationship between slow wave and, 
and higher frequency oscillation or, or higher frequency activity in general. So that seems to be quite true in, in, in many different ranges. So in attention, when alpha, rain, when alpha wave seems to be uh, at its peak, then it shuts down gamma. And it seems to happen in other, other frequency relationship too. So, when, when low, so, so there seems to be a relationship between low frequency and high frequency. So BU today talk about like very, very slow cortical activity as the uh, potential correlator of consciousness. And still talk about gamma, this seems to be still very, very pro-gamma. But because of two actually anti-correlate, so I wonder, is there a way to, to distinguish which is the more true correlate? Because they always come together, right? So when you have a more gamma, you'll have less, or you have a, deep, deep, uh, a deactivation of the, of the slow wave. When you have a deactivation of the slow wave, you have more gamma. So How do we know? So I think there are a couple of different uh, phenomena here. One is that the slow wave you are talking about is more like the up and down state. So that is the oscillation around one hertz, which comes on when you go to sleep or uh, during induction of anesthesia. And um, so the slow potential is a separate phenomenon, which is on all the time in the awake state. Um, and it's modulated by doing a task. And in fact, I would argue that it's positively correlated with gamma, because for the slow potential, we're not arguing that it's a power of the slow potential that's related with cognition, but it's a phase. And um, so the phase of the slow potential that indexes excited, uh, increased excitability, which is a downgoing slope, that's actually correlated with increased gamma. Well, uh, it, it seems to me the slow, uh, the slow waves are, are too, as you said, too slow for, uh, for consciousness. I was against that. Huh? <laughs> I, I was against this. The idea that the slow potential is too slow for consciousness. Well, I, but I think I think it's it's an envelope for faster processing that are, is going on at a smaller <coughs> scale. So uh, it, it could be a, like a fractal uh, higher level of something going on at a faster, smaller scale. So it could could very well be a marker for consciousness. Um, but I but I think having like one conscious moment uh, per second. Uh, wouldn't work because we we have like a strobe effect. So, uh, so I first of all, I, I'm not saying that they. Uh, so there is a, uh, often a misconception about um, if your signal is uh, say one hertz, then the information content in it can't be faster than one hertz. So I disagree with that because of the spatial dimension. So because um, it's, so imagine you have multiple neuronal groups, and each of which is supporting uh, the slow potential phenomenon. But um, and, and each of them is correlated with a different um, content in the conscious awareness. Um, but say if one becomes activated and then it starts to face down, another becomes activated before the first one goes down to baseline, then your conscious content can switch much faster than a full cycle. So you don't need like the first one to go because when we say something is one hertz, that means it takes one second for it to go through a full cycle. But the second neuronal group could be activated far, um, you know, much ahead of the first one goes back to baseline. But that that seems to be is it compatible with the view that ultimately it is gamma that carries the conscious content, and that slow wave is just a modulator that is not the direct immediate That's what I correlator. I, I would um, I would disagree with that. In fact, I, I think uh, um, my personal view, and I, I know there is much a lot of debate in the field. My personal view is gamma is an index of local excitation. Anytime you have a local neuronal group excited, and you get the papa booming. Uh, expressing interneurons involved, you get a pacemaker in the circuit, and you, you have gamma, increased gamma activity. So I think gamma is just an index of local <coughs> excitation. And um, like I mentioned in the talk, we're not saying that the slow potential is the basis for consciousness, but we are saying that it's a layer two, three neuron, neuronal activity and slow potential is an index for that. But and also I think consciousness itself is, is a pretty slow phenomenon. Um, Can I put something in here? <clears throat> when we looked at unconscious patients and we did their power spectra, as they come up through these different levels of consciousness, we call it a gamma ascent. That the gamma power just increases like this. But the same thing happens with evolution. It, ha it happens with the lower animals. And it's not surprising in a way because I was always taught that when you anesthetize someone, you anesthetize them from the top downwards. That is the most recently acquired, most complex part of the brain, are also the most sensitive. 
And that's why if you, if you overdose someone with an anesthetic, then all they got left is their respiratory center. And you can do that if you, you can do that in if you really try hard. If I, if I can comment um, to both of you, actually, um, uh, what, um, Roy John's uh, famous study where uh, patients waking up, uh, or what correlates uh, before they go to sleep and when they come back is, uh, and George can comment on this, is front to back gamma. So I don't agree that it's just local gamma. It's actually trans brain, front to back, right to left, uh, uh, front of parietal at least, gamma synchrony is the best marker for c return of consciousness after anesthesia. And this was uh, recorded with uh, EEG? Yeah. So I don't know if you know this uh, Eval Greenberg paper in Neuron. Yes. So I think a lot of uh, studies showing long distance gamma synchrony in EEG is confounded by this micro saccade that they described. So if you have any tiny, tiny amount of micro saccades or muscle activity, it's going to yeah show up as diffuse gamma activity in the scalp recorded EEG and show up as a synchrony. So I think a lot of um, gamma synchrony by EEG need, you know, has yeah, but, potential okay, compound. So I think we've gone past the muscle artifact stage of gamma, but maybe not. It, it, it is a nasty paper. part. It, it's controversial. But, but, but we, have a, we have a special request for someone from India asking a question. I, I think if IT permitting, we should try to entertain that, but I wonder if it's possible. So, is it happening? Uh, yeah, this is, this, is, this is a question both for Professor Peter Walling as well as Professor Stuart Hamroff. The, uh, as per Penrose Hamroff theory, the, or the wave functions collapse in the presence of proto consciousness, which is existing at the basic Planck level space time geometry. You also said, Professor Hamroff, that Perhaps consciousness is outside the body. Professor Peter Walling mentioned that the, while describing the multidimensional attractors in non-physical space, perhaps the dynamic correlate of consciousness. Now, fractal scale-free consciousness has also been mentioned. It, is, it appears to be a closer view to Eastern philosophy in the sense that what is happening inside the brain, the neuronal activity, is an interface. And the actual stimuli lies outside the body. This consciousness, which may be in the form of proto-consciousness at the basic level of space-time geometry, but by the fractal theory, as you keep on going up in dimensions, the uh, fractal consciousness keeps on strengthening and the lower fractals seem to be images of the original consciousness or the highest consciousness. What ca comment will you make, Professor uh, Walling and Professor Hamroff? I couldn't hear all of that. You're talking about consciousness being outside or inside the body? Yeah. That, that's okay, correct. well, there's an easy answer to that. And that is, well, it's not easy, but if you assume or accept that your conscious thoughts are in perceptual space and not physical space, then a whole lot of uh, problems disappear. Because if you're, you cannot have perceptual space within the brain or without it, because it's a different kind of space altogether. It's, it's not one being, they, they, have, they occur simultaneously, but not in the same place. It's nothing to do with place if you're non-physical. So if I, if I you know, perceive Stuart's beard, it seems to be over there. I think, it's a, I think it's a derivative of my brain. But if it's in perceptual space, it's neither one, because that relegates real space to, the, to, the, to what it really is not. It's not. If it's not in physical space, it's not inside or outside the head. It's in a different kind of space. It may, that space may be a new creation, well, of your brain or of your tubules or whatever. But that's a different kind of space. Quick, follow, quick comment. Too. Yeah, I, I would put that uh, slightly differently. I, I don't know what perceptual space is, but space-time geometry is, is inherently non-local. And our argument that uh, Penrose originally is that consciousness is happening at the level of space-time geometry. Normally, the space-time geometry between the ears in the brain and the microtubules. However, in this fractal idea, as you go down in, in size scale, E gets larger, T gets shorter, 
and eventually you sort of run out of brain and you don't need metabolism anymore because there's plenty of energy in, in the zero point field and what have you. And consciousness in principle, in principle can exist separate from the body uh, along the lines of some of the things Deepak was saying and uh, in direct opposition to what Susan said last night or yesterday that uh, out of body experiences have been disproven by brain stimulation. That's just totally not true because uh, those things are distortions of body perception. They're not anything like the descriptions that people have about it, out of body experiences. So I'm not arguing that there's any proof of this, but I think there's so many anecdotal uh, reports that uh, we should at least consider the possibility. And usually they say, well, no, that's impossible. It couldn't possibly be. Well, here's a mechanism consciousness existing in space-time geometry uh, and, and fractal going, going uh, s more towards the, the Planck scale, that, which, which can be non-local and exist independent of the body. I think that's, it's possible, it's plausible, and should be considered. So I guess I'm the short only question. one here who believes that consciousness cannot exist outside of the body or even outside of the brain. Fair so I'll just leave it like that. <laughs> so we have a short like, question. Uh, to ask the lady, you said that uh, during unconsciousness, the readiness potential disappears. And that is true because it's a correlate of act, conscious act. Um, what is your explanation for readiness potential? From where it arises and due to what? For what? For readiness, readiness potential, potential, yes. Oh, right. So that is, a, as you, the, the cortex becomes ready to execute a, a movement. Um, there is more and more neuron, neurons being recruited for the task, and as more and more uh, neurons get recruited, currents go into the cell. And if you record EEG activity on the surface, you will get a negative potential. So that's, um, I'm sorry. This is the paradigm of linearity that has been rejected. So l l let, me, yeah, let me comment on the readiness potential, because this actually relates to Hakwan's work, as I recall. And, uh, you know, Libet did this volitional work with the readiness potential, which I think uh, is way overshadowed by his much more important uh, sensory uh, potential, sensory uh, uh, studies showing backward time effects. But if you apply the idea of backward time uh, in the brain to the readiness potential, uh, so the assumption now is that the, something unconscious in the brain decides to move the finger, and then subsequent to that, the, the person becomes aware of a desire to move the finger, and subsequent to that, the person moves the finger. Well, if you have the backward time effect, you don't need the unconscious zombie to decide, I'm going to move your finger. It's consciousness deciding to move the finger. You just need this trick of backward time, which we're going to hear about on Friday. So we have another new short question yes. uh, for Peter Wellen. Very much liked your uh, ideas and presentation on many uh, many dimensional attractors uh, producing higher levels of consciousness, as it were. If you have more brain brain areas being brought into synchrony, doesn't this mean that you have higher dimensional attractors? If you have more frequency domains being brought into synchrony, doesn't this also mean you have higher dimensional attractors? I <clears throat> The way I see it is that the, the higher dimensional attractor, suppose, say, a five dimensional attractor, to me, that is the perfect model for binding. This is the one way you can get information synthesized together in a, in a, in a non physical way that you don't need a place for. And uh, yeah, if the, if the, uh, Brain waves are synchronous, so what? Because they're coming in from the different sensory um, places, uh, you know, as, as wave packets, presumably at, at slightly different frequencies. So like if your olfactory wave packet goes forward and it meets, I don't know, your, your taste wave packets, then you can express these different information as long as each wave packet has its own dimension. That's, and that's why I think it's important when we're coming out of anesthesia, for example, that change from periodic to torus attractor is the first time you see these forces, if you like, pushing out into any kind of space at all. All right, so we have another short question here. For, for Peter, Probably the last one, actually. For Peter Walling, the question. 
on the uh, gamma burst that you showed in the, uh, okay, you did a, a, a detailed analysis of the gamma burst and did a Fourier analysis of it, and I noticed that there were regularities at the top and the bottom of those waves that remind me of the work of William A. Tiller on the gauge symmetry of space, the, the signature of uh, gauge to space. Have you ever done a Fourier analysis of those regularities at the top and the bottom of those gamma waves? Uh, I didn't carry on and do much of an analysis of that. I mean, the activity seemed to go to about you know, 100 or so hertz. And then it dropped, and there was activity from like four to six hundred hertz, and then it, then it vanished until we had that artifact. I mean, that slide was really just to, to show that you can pick up an artifact that's at very high frequency and figure out what it is as well. Um, now we didn't. I, we've not actually proceeded with that experiment yet on that vo volition. But that, I thought that was just a nice example of what you can do with a very short segment of EEG when you're stuck with it and you want to analyze it. Now we can, we can, we could download that at 40,000 samples a second, but if we do that, we can only use one channel. The, the program is called Ego4 because it has four channels. So at, at full burst, it's, it's running at 10,000 a channel. But it often hits the error mode when it does that. And also, it heats up the computer considerably. And so we tend to back off and maybe do 8,000 samples. Can I ask what the highest frequency signal coming out of the brain is that you can detect? Because uh, Peter Fenwick was talking about 1,000 hertz. Um, well, the trouble is, I'm not sure whether some of these very small signals are EEG signals or not. I, I, I don't know how to tell. Um, consistently, right, so. I, if, if you see a signal all by itself, I'm very leery about the fact that it's an EEG signal at all. They're usually clumped together. The signal to noise will be very small. But uh, unfortunately, we still have some questions, but time is really up. So uh, we thank the speaker once again and, and conclude the session. I'm sure some of them will be happy to stay on and uh, yeah. continue the discussion.